All right, will you turn to your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading in verse 19. The title for this morning's message is called New Testament Christianity. New Testament Christianity. You know, as the apostolic leader of this house, one who was called to lay the foundation to disciple our leaders, I constantly carry a burden from the Lord to make sure that our body here at the ark is in alignment with New Testament doctrine and practice. I want to say that one more time. As an apostolic leader, one of my primary roles at the Ark Fellowship is to make sure that we as a body are in alignment with New Testament doctrine and practice. And so the message this morning called New Testament Christianity is to invite our body, and if you're visiting, wave at me, Awesome. So if you are here and you're visiting or you're church shopping or you spent Revival Weekend with us and you're going to go back to your body, my desire and my invitation that I believe the Lord is extending us this morning is to invite us into New Testament practice and New Testament doctrine which I firmly believe has nothing to do with a church name, brand, or personality. My, my heart and my calling is not about pumping the ark. You know those series they do, I love my church. I mean, of course, I, I would love for you to love the ark, but I want you to be more loyal and more faithful to Jesus than a brand, a name, or a denomination. So what I'm going to teach today and what I'm going to invite us in today is the Scriptures. And the Scriptures have a higher authority than a brand, a name, or a personality, okay? I I personally believe that in many parts of America, as I'm traveling on most weekends and I'm here, we, we in our minds somehow have put into categories different forms of New Testament doctrine and practice, and then we've made it either multiple choice or a poll. So it's like, who likes this and who likes that? And then we're like, oh yeah, 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 First Assembly has this, and Second Presbyterian has this, and Third Art Fellowship has this, and I think I'll just pick and choose what I like and what I prefer. And what I want to call us into this morning is the wrestle and the invitation from the Lord Jesus Christ who died, who rose again. He shed his blood at Calvary and he has invited us into, first of all, the new birth. So let's just start there. Who's grateful to be born again? All right, good. I'm in the right place. I don't want to be at Frozen Chosen Assembly with Pastor Frigidaire. I'd rather not, okay? So thank God that we're born again, that you and I have been washed, that we've been called out of darkness, that we've been placed into the marvelous light. So we are sons and daughters of the light. So when we said yes to Jesus, we had to say no to other things. If you said yes to Jesus and didn't say no to other things, you didn't get born again. You just prayed a prayer. Just praying a prayer doesn't get you into heaven. Saying yes to Jesus and turning away from other lovers and other idols is what gets us born into the kingdom of heaven. So we become born again and we're going to pick up here in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19. And we're going to, again, we're going to lean into Paul, we're going to learn into Peter, we're going to read some Acts, which is written by Dr. Luke. We're going to look at, I want, I want you to wrestle with me, okay, out of, this is some pro-denomination, pro-church, pro-brand Christian name, and I just want to invite us to wrestle with the Word of God, okay? Am I being clear on that? 
I'm not here to represent a church denomination or a charismatic brand. My highest allegiance and priority as a messenger and as an apostolic voice in the earth is to be loyal to the Word of God. Okay, so as born-again believers, let's see what happens. Ephesians uh, 2.19. So then you, say you, he's talking to us, are no longer strangers and aliens. Strangers and aliens mean we were once a part of darkness. We were once separated by our sin from the Lord, but now we're not aliens and strangers. What are we? We're fellow citizens and saints and are of bedside Baptist with pastor sheets. Ah, oh, man. You guys ever been there, Bedside Baptist with Pastor Sheets? Tough crowd today. Help them, Lord. (laughs) We are fellow citizens who are introverts and don't like people. I feel like a drum roll is coming. But you are fellow citizens with who? The saints. Can you say it again? The saints. Look around this room. We are born again, blood-bought, hopefully Holy Ghost-filled, hopefully demon-casting out, hopefully healing. We want the whole deal. We want everything that Jesus died for and rose again. We're all in. I was once all in for darkness, and now I'm all in for the light, okay? I was not once all in for the devil, and now I'm going to tippy-toe into the kingdom of God. I was all in for the devil, and now I'm all in for Jesus, and now that I'm all in for Jesus, I'm not an alien, I'm not a foreigner, I'm no longer separated from God in His kingdom, but I am a member, I am a citizen, I am a fellow saint, and I am a part of God's household. Somebody clap, okay? We're not orphans. We haven't been left alone at Bedside Baptist with Pastor Sheets. And I'm a Christian and I just don't need anybody. That's not New Testament practice and doctrine. That's orphanhood. Born again, ripped out of darkness to be placed into the household of God as a member where we're now all citizens. Verse 20, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So we're ripped out of darkness, thank God, and we become members We become citizens of God's household, and the foundation of God's household is called Assembly of God. The foundation of God's household is called Jesus' image. The foundation of God's household is called Famous Apostle Prophet Man. Where Jesus Christ dwells, we do not build his house on personalities, charisma, and denominationalism. We build the house of God on this guy named Jesus Christ. He's the head, he's the foundation, he's the cornerstone, he's Lord of all, and he doesn't need any help. Who's the supreme leader here? Jesus. We honor men and women of God, but we don't worship them. The reason why there's so much church hurt is because you stopped honoring them and you started worshiping them. All right, real quick. I'm, just, I'm literally just doing Christianity 101. Born again. 
And I know we have to teach on this of like what it means to be born again because we can't tell. You prayed a prayer, but you're still in darkness. Okay, so stop praying a prayer. Stop false gospel, accept the real gospel, turn away from your sin, become a new man or woman of God, but don't just float around in spiritual polygamy and spiritual promiscuity. Stop visiting a church here on Saturday night, a church here on Sunday night, a church here on Wednesday night, and stop vagabond Christianity. Stop, you know, trying this little hit of Assembly of God and a little hit of Revival Weekend and a little hit of Deliverance and a little hit of YouTube and a little hit of Faith. Stop. Okay? Born again, and now you're placed into a spiritual family. And at the foundation of spiritual family is Jesus. We love Him. We worship Him. We live for Him. We communicate to Him. We make Him Lord and Savior. We refuse to give any other person a place in our life that only He deserves, including your spouse and kids, let alone the church, including your wife and kids. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me for inviting me into your family, that I can make you the foundation, the cornerstone, the head of your church. Thank you, Lord. Are you tracking with me? All right. Say, in whom, verse 21, the whole building is being fitted together. It's growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So once I become a member of God's household, once I get planted so that I can bloom, here are the three main things that's going to happen. I'm learning to be fitted together. I'm learning to be built together. And I'm learning to grow together. What am I doing here? Praise the Lord. I'm here on Sundays, and well, it's up. I guess I'll come back next Sunday. Or it's multiple choice. I'll go to a prayer meeting here, and, you know, I'll go to the homeless outreach here. And guys, get, get beyond. I'm inviting us out of the pole and the multiple choice, and I'm giving us biblical language for as a citizen and as a member of God's family, I'm on a journey. I set my face on a trajectory to, again, it's, it's not rocket science, grow together, being fitted together. What's the next one? Built, fitted, grow. Built, fitted, grow. You can't do any of that by yourself. Welcome to Ark Fellowship. Welcome to First Assembly. Welcome to Second Presbyterian. Welcome to whatever's out there. But if our trajectory according to the Word of God has nothing to do with what it means to be built together, what it means to be fitted together, and what it means to be growing together, we're not practicing New Testament doctrine. We create our own form of Christianity that suits our own needs and desires. It's called consumerism. And we like to fight about, well, this church has this, and this church has this, and I'm sitting here thinking, but what does the Bible say? I, I just, I want to do what the Bible says. I, I'm more loyal to God and His Word than whatever your rendition is. So can we get out of this church is better than this church and I like this one based on and just say, Lord, I want to hit delete on the church insanity and I want to come back to your word and say, teach me, Holy Spirit. 
Teach me, Holy Spirit, what it means to be born again, placed into a family, and then set this trajectory in. What does it mean to be built together? 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter uses similar words that Paul does here. And he talks about how you and I are living stones. And he injects again, Paul says, a building. Peter talks about the church like a house. And he says that we are a house being built together. But if we're living stones, one living stone, you and I, doesn't make a house. Many stones make a house. So without one another being connected, being built together, being fitted together, we will never become the dwelling place that God longs for corporately. All right, let's bow our heads and get out of here. I'm just kidding. How we doing? Most impressive anointing I walk in is called the deer in the headlight. Why'd you come today? What, what in the world is all this even about? Folks, we're growing up in a generation like just inviting them. They're not coming. We, 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 have, we don't know why we're here, what we're doing, where we're going. And again, we can make up and enslave people to our own religiosity. Or we can invite people out of darkness into the family of God and say, Hey guys, one of the primary purposes according to New Testament practice and doctrine is that we're learning how to be built together, fitted together, growing together into a spiritual house. I've been to 400 church planning conferences and still never heard this. <laughs> 400. I paid good money, folks, thousands. What's your vision? What's your mission? Where are we going? Why isn't any of it in the Bible? If anyone in here wants to plant a church, I'm, I'm giving you your mission statement. I'm giving you your vision. I'm, I'm giving you, but why do we think we're wiser than God? Why do we think we can do it better than him? Why do we appeal to westernized CEO model of doing churches and then whine and complain? And then whine and complain about how we got hurt by Babylon. If you are tired of being hurt, if you are over American religion, if you really want change, if we really want to be New Testament Christians, not American Christians, we're going to have to make steps and change the way that we think. And ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten the eyes of our hearts according to the word of God that we might know him better. So let's talk about our revival weekends here at the Ark. How many of you have attended one of our revival weekends? I believe that the word revival is not in the New Testament because they didn't need a word for what they were living. There's no word revival in the New Testament because they did not need a word for what they were walking in. What are you saying? Revival is New Testament Christianity. When we're walking out New Testament Christianity, we're walking in revival. So a great question to ask then is, I'm so glad you asked, what is New Testament Christianity? Is the scripture clear or are there any clues for you and I as members of God's household? We know that we're supposed to be being fitted together, growing together, and being built together. But is there any kind of themes 
or are there any kind of indicators for us that the book of Acts is never meant to stop at being descriptive, it's also prescriptive. When you read the book of Acts in the first century church, it's more than a description of what is happening. It is also a prescription of what's supposed to be happening today. So let's turn to Acts chapter 2. Look at your neighbor, say you're going to make it. Stop crying. It's going to be all right. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So revival weekends at the ark are intended to be a catalyst to facilitate New Testament Christianity. Revival weekends at the ark are intended to be a catalyst for New Testament Christianity. In other words, the New Testament is radically opposed to event-oriented Christianity. The New Testament is radically opposed to Sunday morning Christianity. The New Testament is radically opposed to you and I filling up our schedules as busy as we can and then we'll try to fit in God. I know American Christianity makes room for it all and you know, thank God most of us are going to heaven, but when was the goal of our faith to make it to heaven? That ranks like 17 on my list. The reason why I'm born again is not to just get to heaven, it's to see heaven on earth. See, you have to move beyond a salvation issue to an inheritance issue. People that have one foot in darkness and one foot in the world are constantly, they're straying this, strutting this line of how much of my sin can I hold on to and still get into heaven? That is someone who's lukewarm at best. Someone that is once all in for darkness and now all in for the kingdom has nothing to do with religiosity. They're just in tune with what Jesus died and rose again for. Someone who was once in radical darkness and now telling them Sunday morning Christianity won't cut it. That's not legalism, that's good Bible. How did you once go clubbing and get drunk and hang out till 3 a.m. and now you can't even stand church for an hour? That's not legalism, that's not promoting denominationalism, that's confronting idolatry. That's actually someone who loves you enough to challenge the foundation of your faith and say, you've got to get away from this. How much of my sin can I have and still make it into fire insurance? We've got to get away from the lukewarm danger zone into all in Christianity where we don't tell God what to do. He tells us what to do. We don't order our schedule around God. We order our, our, we order our schedule around God, not God around our schedule. I, I feel like I've lost you. I'm not, I'm not asking you to, again, pledge allegiance to ark doctrine or assembly. I'm asking you to wrestle with the Scriptures. So Jesus walks with his disciples for a period of three and a half years. He dies, he rises again, and he tells them to wait in the upper room to tarry for the promise of the Father. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, it says, in gathering them together. In verse 6, it says, and so when they had come together... In verse 13, and when they had entered, they went up in the upper room where they were staying together. 
Verse 14, these all, with to, these all together with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. The emphasis is on together. He dies, he rises again in Acts 1, they're together. In Acts chapter 2, and when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all Man, you're 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 cramping my my calendar. I, I, I my indiv my individualism, my my cult of self. Oh, I've made my family an idol. And my time and my schedule and. My, I mean, I, 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 I'm born again, brother, but I don't have any time for New Testament practice or doctrine. But I do have time for a one Sunday a month, maybe. And, you know, they, they have this revival weekend. They, they must be, you know, serious about God. Maybe I'll make one a year. And, you know, prayer, that's sort of important. And, you know, maybe, you know, if they start bombing Israel, yeah, I mean, Israel, and yeah, we'll pray. We need to pray. And we make, again, we pull and we make multiple. And, we, again, we make it about, well, this church is doing this and this denominator, but you already got off course. What does the Bible say? This has nothing to do with churches, denominations, and a fight for your loyalty. New Testament Christianity is challenging our own beliefs and convictions about who we know God to be and what it means to follow Jesus. Can you separate them? Can you hear the voice of God through messengers and people saying, Stop getting mad at this church because they pray too much. And just ask the Holy Spirit, am I praying too much? This has nothing to do with the church inviting you to prayer. This is about what it means to be a New Testament Christian. Can't believe they're asking me. would shape the course of history. But what I want you to notice is they go from being together in an upper room and experiencing a significant move of God to the next thing that happens is a wineskin or a structure is created that helps to facilitate longevity. Revival weekends at the ark were never meant to be an end in and of themselves. Revival weekends are meant to facilitate New Testament Christianity. Take it apart from the ark. Who's been to a church conference, any church conference in the last year? That event, that big, how you know it's legitimate or a pep rally is longevity. Oftentimes at corporate events, 
what's going to happen is you're going to get the funk knocked off of you. What's that mean? You're going to get lukewarm Christianity challenged and they're going to invite you back into New Testament practice and doctrine. Because New Testament practice and doctrine knows nothing of Sunday morning Christianity. So when the preacher or Billy Bob is calling you to prayer, they're not being religious, they're not being legalistic, they've just read their Bible. We can have all our categories for this and that, but they're just being faithful to the Word of God. So conferences and events and all of those things, Sunday morning, great, I got my two hours in. That's supposed to be facilitating walking out a structure or a wineskin that cultivates a revival lifestyle. Revival is not an event, it's a lifestyle. It's New Testament Christianity. But New Testament Christianity was never supposed to be mysterious, nor was New Testament Christianity supposed to look like anything we've built in America. If this building burned down, if we lost our building structures in America, what is left is what is New Testament. Oh, man, guys. Oh, we, don't, we don't have anywhere to go. It was never about anywhere to go. It was about a people being fitted together, built together, and growing together. That doesn't happen on Sundays. Uh-oh. Oh, man, but if that's all I have to get, you're in trouble. If all you have to offer is an hour on Sunday, we're out of New Testament practice and doctrine. <laughs> a church, it has nothing to do with denominations, men or women. It's about do we want to be New Testament Christians according to the Word of God? Or do we want to continue to practice the religious traditions of men that are leading millions to hell in America and are unpreparing us for the shaking that's coming to this nation. All right, I, I believe most of us are good Bible students. I think most of the message this morning is when are you going to stop being a hearer and actually be a doer? Because we know, okay? Acts 2, 42 through 47. We've been talking about New Testament practice and doctrine, okay? So what was the structure? What was the wineskin? What was the New Testament living that happened as a result of a move of God? All right, are you ready? Verse 42. So 3,000 people get saved doing it God's way. You can imagine God's way of planning churches is just people speaking in tongues rather than having interest meetings. I still don't know what that means, church planning interest meetings. Is that like based off of whether people are interested you're going to obey God or not? Guys, the first century church was birthed through Shandarabakayaraba. Wow, brother, that's offensive. They had a lot. 3,000 people got saved. Lord, send revival. We need a heart. Let's do it His way then. Why pray for revival and a move of God in America and continue to do it our way, not His? Three thousand people get saved, and here we go, verse forty-two. And they were occasionally, when they felt like it, when they had time, when their schedule opened up. Is that in there? I, don't, I can't see that. Verse 
We want New Testament results without New Testament practice. We cry and we pray and we ask and then we just take a hit at a conference. Awesome. Corey Russell, man, that brother, he must really pray. I got a hit of that at the altar. Hopefully that lasts me till next, next month. Oh, the pastor had such a good word on Sunday. I mean, that's, that'll be my Bible reading this week. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll get something next week. Oh, you know, I did a little shut about a Hyundai, you know, during the, so I don't need to pray in tongues this week. Oh, brother, I feel so much condemnation when you preach. It's called conviction. I, I feel a confrontation. I feel an invitation. I feel a wrestle coming on me of, Lord, how have I been saved for decades? And my life is still so far away from what you died for and rose again. It says they were continually devoting themselves that word continually in the Greek is continually. <laughs> Not once a week, once a month, when I feel like it, when I can get to it. My life is just so busy and scheduled. I don't have any time for God, but Lord, would you save my prodigal? I mean, can you imagine a healthy marriage if you felt like it when, when you had time, you know? How many of us know in healthy marriage you have to be intentional? You have to be, you, you, you have to get this stuff down. So four things here. New Testament, guys, it's all in the Bible. I'm, I'm, I'm going to rest easy this afternoon by saying, Lord, I gave him your word. New Testament Christianity, they're walking in revival. How are they practicing New Testament doctrine? One, they gave themselves to the next movie series. Oh, man. I thought you were going to give some reprieve, preacher. I mean, they gave, you know, 10 steps to a better life. And do you know sermonettes produce Christianettes? Oh, brother, I just can't pay attention. I need you to just 15 minutes or just shut up and sit down. But you play video games six hours a day. But, but you're going to watch a rated R movie and hold your pee so you can get through the climax. It's called idolatry. We need to repent. We have time for every, and don't even get me started about money. You shopped at Target. You went to Starbucks. Good gracious, you've ordered Amazon 25 times this month. We throw our hair in, but the moment there's an offering, it's like the clench comes on. It's called idolatry. We love our schedules. We love our items. We love them more than Him. Just be honest. Can you imagine trying to convince your wife you loved her, but you don't have her as a priority? She would probably tell you the truth. Liar. He's not our priority. We're not willing to sacrifice. We're not willing to <clears throat> shift things around, but... By golly, I'll make, I'll make it, we're going on vacation. I mean, we're going on a really good vacation. We don't care how much we spend. We don't care. Heck, we're in America. We'll take 10 vacations a, a year. But when it comes to sacrifice, when it comes to lavish, when it comes to giving ourselves to new, t I don't have time for it. No, just, just confess it's not that you don't have time for it. It's just not a priority. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. New Testament practice and doctrine, they give themselves to the apostles' teaching. 
Guys, I promise you that these apostles were not teaching three steps to a better life. They taught on who they beheld. It says that it was the preaching of your best life now that turned cities and regions upside down. What does it say? What turns cities and regions upside down? The preaching of the resurrection. It wasn't the Easter bunny. It wasn't a once a year and praise the Lord. It was the death, the life, the burial, the ascension, the resurrection. They were Christ-centered. He was not a sermon series. He was the life. He was the way. He was the truth. They lived in Him and through Him. They devoted themselves to fellowship. This is the Greek word koinonia. In fact, this is the strongest of all Greek words concerning relationships. This means intercourse. Now, don't get weird on me. When they continually devoted themselves to fellowship... This had nothing to do with who you sit by at church on Sunday. This was a deep, intimate connection. And how many of us know you can't connect with people at a deep level if you don't have time for them? All right, let me save you a little dose of church hurt. Are you ready? Stop coming to church on Sunday two hours a week expecting some deep, intimate relationship. Never going to happen. You will never deeply know people on a Sunday. Why? They're worshiping. They're listening. If you want deep, intimate relationships with fellow citizens of God's household, we're going to have to invite them to coffee into our home. We're going to have to sacrifice something for this thing if it's important, if I really want to be a New Testament Christian. Well, no one's called me. Have you called them? Well, there's not enough church cookouts going on. I don't see church cookouts. I mean, it's nice that they do them, but it's the responsibility of the believer to say, I don't care what this church or denomination, I want God for myself. I want to be a New Testament Christian, and I'm going to give myself to the apostles' teaching. In other words, thank you for whatever sermon is offered on Sunday, but I'm really looking forward to Bible study tomorrow morning. I'm really looking forward to opening up my Bible Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Tracking with me? Fellowship. Lord, deliver us from individualism. Lord, deliver us from ah, picking and choosing when we want to show up or not or all our excuses of why we can't. And then, you know, those intercessors. What? What? They devoted themselves to prayer. I'm not an intercessor. There's no such thing as ministry of intercession. The call to prayer is a call to become a Christian. The call to prayer is you cultivate your interior life. I'm not going to re-preach Corey's sermon, but having prayer meetings at a church is weird to me. I'm not going to the prayer meeting. When people say that, I don't hear it like that. I hear, I don't want to be a Christian. Because it's not about the prayer meeting. It's about a lifestyle. We pray every day, and when the doors are open to pray, we do whatever that we can to get there, not because I love my church. I love Jesus. Are you hearing me? Just a few more minutes. I'm trying to stop loving and worshiping churches and men and all of these things and just cast off the fetters and the cords of religion this morning and just say, Jesus, I want to know you. 
Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for rising from the dead. Thank you for placing me in your family. And Lord, help me to know what it means to grow together, to be fitted together, to be built together. And Lord, I want to be on fire. I want to live in revival. What does that mean? Lord, I want to constantly be after you, Christ. I want to hear more messages about Christ. I want to be a man or woman of prayer. Lord, I want to be a man or woman of fellowship. I want to be connected to my brothers and sisters. And then, Lord, I want to be a man or woman who knows how to break bread. And this ain't about the pizza. I hate to break it to you. When they said breaking bread, it's not going to Mexican after church. That's fellowship. I hope you'll do that. But breaking a bread, it's communion. It's remembering the death, the blood, the resurrection. Again, some people are like, yeah, brother, there's no community at this church. The ark sucks. And if you say that, I don't really know because you've got Pastor Chad. And I'm like, guys, community is not about, well, they're not doing anything for me. And I don't know who I am. So I'm going to find who I am in the midst of a group of people. No real biblical community is you bring something to the table. You don't suck the life out of people. Oh. Woe is me. No one likes me. I know there's no... Re- Their community was around, let's stop talking about us and let's start talking about him. When you think community, think of the bread and the blood at the center, not your problems and your needs. It's going great today. Thank you, Lord. Can I just, I I wrote all these down just real real quickly. I'm going to blame it on Chad. His announcements were too long. Okay. (laughs) One another. One another. I wrote these down, okay? One another. The New Testament is full of one another. I get that what I'm bumping up against in the Spirit, and I hope nobody manifests on me today, but what I'm bumping up in in the Spirit is individualism. It's Baal. It's the cult of self. We've resurrected it in America. It's a a same devil, new, new decade, if you will. But the New Testament is all about a group of people doing life together, praying together, fighting uh, against the devil together. But this theme of one another, okay, love one another, mutually depend on one another. I'm reading you all scriptures. Be devoted to one another, outdo one another in showing honor, rejoice with one another, weep with one another. Have the same mind toward one another. Don't judge one another. Accept one another. Counsel one another. Greet one another. Wait for one another. Care for one another. Serve one another. Bear one another's burdens. Be kind to one another. Forgive one another. Submit to one another. Forbear, is this getting redundant? Encourage one another. Build up one another. Stir up one another. Be hospitable to one another. Minister gifts to one another. Be clothed in humility to one another. Don't speak evil against one another. Don't grumble against one another. Confess your faults to one another. Pray for one another. Fellow. Oh, my word. I'm the church. I don't need you. I'm saved and do it and on my own. You're in the orphanage. And guys, I, I get because I grew up a PK and we've been in you know, the ministry fully surrendered 15 years now. Church planning, traveling, the whole thing. I get it. It's like, yeah, do you know that lady to my left, bro? Love her? Forgive her? Uh Uh-uh. I'm going to get hurt. 
Welcome to the family of God. Can you imagine if Jesus had the same mindset? He would have never died. While we were yet sinners. But they're going to. He still came. And with his last breath, he said, Father, forgive them. Church is so messed up. They hurt me. Father, forgive them. And at the end of the day, folks, again, I close with, it's not about some denomination or some charismatic name brand. This is about saying, Jesus, I want to be a Christian in New Testament practice and doctrine. And then the next time that I'll preach, I'll begin to unpack more of this but that next verse after it lists the four it says that they're in awe and I believe a lot of people wrongly place the awe on the miracles but if you look at it in the Greek and even in the English the awe has nothing to do with the miracles the awe has to do with they continually gave themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, to fellowship. Awe and wonder filled their heart because the gospel had delivered them from individualism and united them together in covenant family. Lord, fill our hearts with awe and wonder that we got delivered in Canapolis of Sunday morning Christianity And you begin to unite a family together in love. How we doing? How mad at me are you? I love you. All right, I want to pray for two groups. Sir, on the the top row with the glasses, you're wearing, I don't know if it's a sweater, all the way in the back row. African-American gentleman. Yeah, would you stand? Let's stretch our hands toward this brother. Father, I thank you for this son of God. And I thank you that you've not only raised him up as a leader, but the Lord says, I have anointed you as a reformer in this hour. The Lord says that you are called to shake systems, religious systems. And the Lord says that I'm moving you out of an era. It's more than a couple of years. It's an era where you were tolerated. And now I'm going to bring you into a land where you are celebrated. And the Lord says, I remove the lid, the lid, the lid off of you right now in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, for the full manifestation of the apostolic anointing on his life. And I command every religious box that's been placed around you for decades to be broken in Jesus' name. And the Lord says that you will not do another man's bidding. You will not be a token that others can just prostitute you on a stage or for their bidding. For the Lord says that your days are coming where you will lead the people courageously and you will reform religious systems and you will make a way for the Lord. I call forth the prophetic anointing on you to make crooked paths straight. I say that you were destined and designed for holy confrontation. And the Lord says that where you've limped and where you've had scars, I will heal it all. And I see a writing anointing coming upon you where you will begin to chronicle and you will begin to reveal that which the Lord has revealed to you. The Lord says you're pregnant with a blueprint. You're, pleg- you're pregnant with your next. And even as you're walking through the wilderness, the Lord says, I'm going to split the Red Sea. I indeed am going to open up a territory for you. Yes, I even have a people prepared for you who have been underneath religious oppression. And so we give thanks to you, Lord, today that you're making a way, that you're anointing your servant, that you're calling him forth for such a time as this. In Jesus' name, amen.
want to pray for two groups. One, I want to call you to all in. I hope everybody would stand for me. I want to call you out of, I once served the devil radically, and now I'm just trying to fit God in when I can. All in means I'm willing to sacrifice my schedule, my agenda, really whatever the Lord wants, I'm in. So be like, well, I don't know what to say. Just say I'm all in. Sometimes you needing to know what it is means you have a control spirit. You're still trying to control what God can do with you and what he can't do with you. I want to call you. I feel like some of you, God is preparing you to launch out. I I feel in my spirit the Lord is saying, there's some church planters in this room. There's some people that are called to birth ministries. There are some people that God wants to send out, but you have to go all in today. And part of going all in today, I want you to listen to me, part of going all in today is releasing all the churches and all the men who hurt you, and I want you to pledge allegiance to Jesus Christ like never before. Lord, I'm not going to give your voice to someone else's voice. I will follow you. I will do whatever that you tell me to do. So whether you have this call to maybe launch out or you're just here and saying, Lord, I want more of you. I don't know what this community thing looks like. I know I'm supposed to be praying. I don't know why I don't want to pray. But Lord, I'm signing up for New Testament practice and doctrine. Lord, I'm all in. If that's you, I want you to stand. Well, brother, I'm already there. I don't need to stand. If your shadow is not healing the sick, you're not all there. Stop the religious pride and games. All right, grab the hand of the person next to you. Father, Lord, we're gathered here today as your citizens, as your sons and daughters, as your household. Lord, I'm so grateful that you're setting a people free in the earth from religious slavery. Lord, you are delivering us from some kind of carnal commitment to churches and denominationalism and our charismatic heroes. Lord, I pray that you would cast off those fetters and those cords. Lord, we honor men and women of God, but we do not worship them. And so, Lord, here we are. We sign up, God. We say yes. I want you to just all over this room, just for two minutes, just say yes. Lord, I give you my car, I give you my house, I give you my schedule, I give you my comforts, my conveniences. Lord, I give you my sin, whatever it is, just two minutes, just talk to God. More, Lord. More, Lord. Come on, go all in. I want you to pray dangerous prayers. Lord, we're willing. We're able. It says the spirit of generosity broke out among them. They began to sell things. They began to shift things. They began to make certain things a priority that were not once a priority. Lord, we're asking, mold us, shape us, shift us, change us. fire of the Holy Spirit come fire of the Holy Spirit come come and heal the wounded in this room God come and heal those of us who have been wounded by the church and leaders God we thank you for a healing balm Lord we declare that it's okay to trust again we declare that it's a new day it's a new season Lord Keep hearing the Lord say, stop blaming a church 
for your inheritance. Lord, we're going to stop blaming what other people have done or not done as a legitimate reason for why we're not walking in New Testament practice and doctrine. And I feel this anointing coming in the room to bring freedom to others. I hear the Lord saying, I've brought my freedom fighters. I've brought my liberators. I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, I'm gathering a family in the ark in days of shaking. That as shaking comes and people are going to begin to search for safety. They're going to begin to search for refuge. I heard the Lord saying, you will not and shall not enslave them to another church. Or I, I just, as a father in the house, I just free you in Jesus' name from trying to get people to sign up for another church. We don't need more churches. We need sp spiritual families. Lord, I just break a Saul spirit. Some of you have been handicapped. Some of you have been stifled in your calling and your gifting because there was a man or woman of God who always felt threatened. They felt intimidated by you. They would only let you grow up to a certain extent, but then they would suppress you. Does anyone identify with that? Lord, we just break that right now in Jesus' name. Lord, all religious manipulation, I just break the power of charismatic witchcraft. I command you to come out from underneath that right now in Jesus' name. You will not be stifled and you will not be stymied any longer. I break the power of physical affliction attached to charismatic, charismatic witchcraft. Some of you were part of some kind of church or ministry or network where your body has begun to manifest physically that control spirit that tried to come upon you. We just say in Jesus' name, let lids be broken off. I just see geysers in the spirits. I see the Holy Spirit just breaking things open today. Lord, we just ask, some of you are not all in because you have allowed the hypocrisy on the platform to draw you into, into cynicism and into criticism. And Lord, we just ask right now for freedom from criticism and cynicism. I'll never trust church and trust, you should have never worshiped them, but Lord, I just ask in Jesus' name that you would free somebody from the power of cynicism and criticism. You saw someone fall. You saw a leader abuse the gifts and you've, you've made oaths in your heart. I'll never be that guy, I'll never. And today the Lord says, I'm breaking those oaths that were made in the soulish realm. I'm breaking oaths today that were made because you were hurt. Lord, I just pray for soulish covenantal oaths to be broken in the name of Jesus. I pray every root of church trauma to be extracted and uprooted out of us today in Jesus' name. The Lord says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. And we say, let water come forth today. Let it come forth out of bellies. Let living water run forth again. Again, Lord, let not broken cisterns be our portion anymore. But Lord, you are an inexhaustible fountain that will never run dry. And I just pray for a deluge of the Spirit of God to begin to come into this place. We say, oh God, would you rend the heavens and come down? Would you revive your people in Canapolis? Would you revive your saints in America? It's a new day. 
day. It's a new era. It's a new season that's coming. And we say in Jesus' name, be free. 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 Come on, let's give Jesus a round of applause today. Let's give him a shout of praise. All right, so look around the room. I didn't have an altar call because you're getting ready to do it. Please stop listening to messages and not doing anything with them. Stop. That's not New Testament practice and doctrine. That's American Christianity. Stop. What does it look like? Could you invite someone out to eat today? I'll pay for it. I don't have any money. I'll take that away. Yeah, I'll give you some money. Can we get together and pray? Can we fellowship? Can we take communion? Can, can we do something different this week that will begin to help us begin to move toward biblical Christianity? Is anybody willing to do that? All right. We love you, we bless you, may all your introvertedness disappear. If there's anyone socially awkward in here, I just pray a fresh anointing on you to... All right, I'm done, I've done too much today. God bless you guys, have a, have a great afternoon.